Appreciate you guys. The Lord is worthy of all praise, glory, and honor. We are going to take a moment. I've asked Miss Linda if she would come, please. Nell Smith, it was mentioned in the prayer as uh, Tony was praying for her. Uh, she needs a special touch from the Lord. And uh, so I would also ask Pastor Simon if you would please come. And the deacons, uh, the current deacons, if you would please come. Uh, and, and uh, lay your hands on her as well, and leadership if you'd like to come as well. We're going to lift up Miss Nell. Uh, Miss Linda's going to stand in her place and just ask. We're not the only church praying for her today either, which is awesome. And I believe that there's strength in numbers as we're going to lift her up and uh, in the prayer to this morning. Father, right now we anoint uh, Miss Linda in Nell's place. And Father, we're asking right now that you would touch her body. Lord, she needs a touch from you. She needs a special anointing from you. And we believe that you are a miracle worker, that you are a provider, you're our healer, and that you can do these things, that nothing is impossible for you, but all things are possible through you. And we're asking that you would send your anointing right now upon her body. May she feel the fire of your presence right now from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet. And we ask for you that you would just heal her completely remove any t trace of cancer, yes, baffle God, the doctors, and may this be a witness of your strength and mercy as well. We love you and praise you, Lord. We're believing for great things to happen today in Miss Nell's body. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap offering. He's worthy, he is worthy, glory. Bless the Lord, he is awesome. I'll tell you, I'm looking forward to this. I've been looking forward to this morning. Glory. There's, um, this is exciting. We're going to be talking about the greatest promise as ever made. And if you would, before we even get into our scripture this morning, I want you to be, I want you to open what your, the Bibles, there should be a Bible there in a the pew to Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6, we find an account where Jesus is out speaking to a multitude of people. There were 5,000 men plus women and children. And they had been with him all day. Now you have to imagine that back where Jesus was at in that time period, there was no McDonald's. There was no mariachis. There was no place in the wilderness where they could just take a break and go get something to eat. So they stayed there all day long listening to Jesus. So the next time you get uncomfortable if the sermon goes over five minutes, think about that. No, I'm just kidding. That's not what the point of. They stayed there all day long with Jesus. And, but at the end of the day, Jesus said, give them something to eat. The disciples said, Jesus, we need to let these people go so they can go home and eat. He said, you give them something to eat. And the disciples were like, Lord, even if we had 200 denarii or whatever it was, 200 days worth of wages, how are we going to feed all these people? There's not enough bread around to feed them. And Jesus said, what do you have? Well, we have these five loaves and two fish, or two fishes. So he took that, what he was given, he broke it, he gave it to the disciples. They handed it out. It fed all 5,000 men plus the women and children. And they collected 12 basketfuls afterwards. That's amazing. Because they didn't start with 12 baskets. Unless if those are really, really big loaves of bread and big fish, right? They just started with two fish and five loaves. And they picked up the 12 afterwards. And when they got done, Jesus told the disciples, he says, get in the boat and go to the other side. I'll meet you there. And what did Jesus do in Mark 6? He went, he, he went and prayed. The middle of the night then, I love Jesus' mode of transportation. Or I should say his, his ways of getting, he walked, right? And it didn't matter. He, he walked across the water. And as he's walking across the water to the disciples, 
Was the disciples like, hey, it's Jesus? No, they were like, whoa, it's a ghost. It's the ghost light. (laughs) I mean, they were scared. (laughs) Jesus said, fear not, it is I. But what's interesting about this passage is that in verse 50 we see, for they saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked to them and said, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them and the wind ceased and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled for they had not understood about the loaves. This is so fascinating. They marveled. Why? They had not understood about the loaves because of their unbelief, right? Because their heart was hardened is what this says which is because of unbelief. Their heart was hardened. These are the disciples. These are the guys that Jesus is pouring his life into. These are the men that Jesus is going to send out to the world. And the Bible says their heart was hardened. And it it never really dawned on me. I've read over that passage a, a bunches of times, and then it started to click. Hardness of heart stops things from happening in the life. For example, what would happen right now if your heart just turned to stone? I mean, game over, right? You're checking out. <laughs> we're, great. we're carrying you out of here. You ain't going out by your own will. If your heart hardens up right now, that's it. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Why? Because our heart, our blood pump keeps us going. I went this past week to have mine checked because I've never had that done. And they, they found I do have a heart. I just want to let you know that it's there. Some, some you know, he, I'm just not convinced, but it's there. And it checked out good, which was really good. But if our blood pump stops, if it starts beating, if it becomes hard, life ceases. Unbelief is what the cause of that. You see, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? Understanding is to depart from evil. And we know that anything that's not of faith is sin, which is evil, right? Their unbelief was actually sin. Their hardness of heart was actually sin. It was was unbelief. It was not a good thing. It's a bad thing. And when the heart becomes hardened like that because of unbelief, the, the life of God doesn't pump through it. There's a lack of connectivity. There's things don't fire right. And if our heart is hard this morning, even though we may be called a disciple of Christ, if our heart is hard for what we're about to hear, then it's like bouncing off of a brick wall and it doesn't take hold. It's stony ground. Does that make sense? But the good news is that God can take a stony hard heart and turn it into a heart of flesh, into something that, his life can flow through and his faith can restore and, and, and cause to grow and, and great things can happen. You see, we're going to be talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit this morning. And I can sit and talk to you this morning until I'm blue in the face about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But if your heart is hard, it's just going to bounce right off. Are you with me? But if the heart is soft, if it's malleable, pliable, then the Lord can work. He can do something. So if you've been looking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, check your heart this morning first. Is it one of faith expecting to receive? Or is it one of fear saying, nah, I tried it before, but it's just, that's just not for me. Okay? There's a difference between a hard heart and a soft heart. May your heart be soft this morning to what the Lord is about to reveal. Amen? Would you stand with me as we read from Acts chapter 1? We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Paul writes, he says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, 
after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen of them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit promised. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Let's pray. Father, may our hearts be open. May they be pliable before you. If there's any hearts of stone, I ask that you would remove those right now. And Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place to have your way, to have your will, and to, to, to come upon us, to speak through us, to, to heal, to, to set free. Lord, I pray for any in this place that don't know Jesus as their Savior. May today be the day of salvation. May today be the day that they choose to follow after Christ. I pray for those that are seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And as we come before for you this morning. We surrender our will to yours. We surrender ourselves to you. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you take over and be welcome in this place? You are welcome to do as you please. In Jesus' precious name, Father, use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat this morning. The power of the Holy Spirit. You know, our our world is possessed, I would say possessed, it's, well, it, it likes power. And you can see this everywhere. We have machines that can drill through mountains. And I'm not talking just small holes here. We're talking huge, big holes. As a matter of fact, top left-hand corner there, you can see a picture of one. Rockets that can escape gravity and take men to the moon. Um, they can take them, I mean, it's just, it's amazing what they can do with these things. Put satellites in space. Engines, car engines with more and more horsepower. <laughs> we have nuclear weapons that can wipe out cities. And as a matter of fact, I believe it wipe out the whole world if they wanted to. I pray that that day doesn't come. It won't. The Lord will intervene first. But our world is obsessed with power. While much has been achieved through science and engineering, man's quest for power continues. And it's not an issue that's related just to the physical world, world, but there is a power in the spiritual world as well. Now, the purpose and use of spiritual power is much different than physical power. It is nonetheless crucial to accomplishing God's purpose in his kingdom for this world. And when Jesus, before he returned to earth, or returned to the Father in heaven, he commissioned his followers. Are you a follower? Yes, you are. If you love Christ and you've accepted him as Savior. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And then he added, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Making disciples was gonna be a monumental task though. And Jesus knew that his followers would face many challenges and many obstacles in fulfilling this commission because we have an enemy who doesn't want this to happen. Therefore, the Lord knew that they would need power beyond their physical ability. And provision was made for that power, and it's still available today to every believer who is willing to receive it. This goes back to the pliable heart. And I pray that you're willing this morning to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and if you've not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I ask you to begin praying now that he will fill you to overflowing with his presence and his power today, this morning. No sense in waiting. Let's let her rip, tater chip. Amen. You see, Jesus promised to send his power. He promised it. He said that he would send the Holy Spirit to help his followers. While on earth, Jesus taught the principles of God to his disciples. He was constantly teaching them in parables. And then he would take them aside and say, yes, you don't understand this, but this is what this means. He would teach them his, the, the, the principles of the kingdom. He healed the sick everywhere he went. Jesus couldn't even get alone. To, I mean, it was just constantly, he had to sneak away. He had to be very sneaky, sir, in order to get away from people just so he could spend time alone with the Father. In Luke 5, 17, it states, now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out 
of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And get this, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Father, may your power be present this morning to heal. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Are you with me? Okay. We're Pentecostals. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe that God is not done with miracles today. We believe that God is just as powerful today as he was back then. We believe that God can do those things today that he did back then. We believe that we are the Christ's disciples, therefore he can work through us. So I'm expecting him to move today. Amen? My, man, I feel that. I mean, I just feel that there's an expectancy. Hallelujah. Not only did he heal the sick, but he also cast out devils. An example of this is Matthew 8. Jesus comes to a place and he, uh, uh, he finds a demoniac. And this dude couldn't be tamed. They couldn't, they couldn't chain him up. They couldn't shut him up. I mean, he was a, a threat not only to the people around him, but also to himself. He would cut himself with rocks. But Jesus set him free. It didn't matter. Jesus walked up and said, who are you? And, and the thing says, we are legion, for we are many. And they were like, have you come to torment us before our time? Would you please just send us into those pigs over there? And there was a herd of about 2,000 pigs. I don't know about you, but that's a lot of pigs. And that legion went into those pigs. And those pigs didn't like it. As a matter of fact, it says that they ran off the cliff and drowned in the sea. It's the first episode of Pigs in Space. <laughs> I mean, they were gone. That's right, flying bacon right there. But he healed the demoniac. He set him free. The demoniac was no longer possessed. Why? Because the power of the Lord was present to heal him. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. He's with us. We should expect that to be normal, to lay hands on people and see them recover. We should expect it to be normal, to speak the word and the demons flee. It shouldn't be an abnormal thing for us. It should be a place where we say, yep, I'm going to church. I'm going to see who gets healed this week. <laughs> I like it. You want to reach the lost? Set them free. Heal them. But, but I can't do that. You can through the Holy Spirit. You have been granted the gift of the Holy Spirit. The boy, there was a boy with seizures as well. In Mark 9, we find a, a father who's just desperate. He's like, Jesus, heal my boy. He keeps, he's possessed. He, a demon grabs hold of him and he falls down oftentimes into the fire or into the water. What do you think that demon's trying to do to that boy? He's trying to kill him. Why? Because Satan's got three objectives for your life, to steal, to kill, and destroy. And he's like, please help me. And Jesus cast that devil out of him and set the boy free. Why? Because the power of the Lord was present to heal. He set him free. Jesus poured his life and his teachings into his followers. But you know, he knew that a day would come where one day he would not be with them physically. And Jesus passed the mantle onto his disciples. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. He would have to go away and return to the Father so that he could send the Holy Spirit who would convict the world of sin and God all who would follow Christ into the great truth of his teachings. And from this, our passage this morning, we read that Jesus told his disciples to wait for the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. Following the resurrection, Jesus helped his disciples understand what had taken place and why. The task before them would be large, it would be huge. So they were to wait for the gift or the promised Holy Spirit until they had been clothed with power from on high. 
in Luke 24, 49. And just before returning to the Father, Jesus told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for that gift that God had promised. You do realize that Jesus hung out with the disciples for a while before he went back to the Father. You know, a lot of times we get into the Easter mode. And the Easter mode is, okay, Jesus died on the cross, he rose again from the dead, and then he disappeared. Okay, that's not what happened. Okay, he died, he rose again from the dead, he went to the Father, he spent time with the disciples here on earth for a period of time. He was seen by over 500 people. And then he descended into heaven. He left the, he went, he, he left the disciples some instructions before he left. So it was a good thing. I mean, he hung around with them and he told them what to expect. The gift of the Holy Spirit continues today and it, con- it consists of real and essential spiritual power from God. And we refer to that gift as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this power is for every believer. You see, Pentecost was promised before the New Testament, long before the New Testament times. More than 800 years before Christ was born, the prophet Joel announced this from Joel 2, 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass, not it may happen, but it shall come to pass that afterward I will pour out my spirit on all all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And, and no one, no one would be excluded from this offer. We also know that the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You see, in Acts 2, Peter quoted Joel's prophecy explaining that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit had happened just as it was promised by the prophet 800 years prior to. He's like, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he went through the list. You see, the last days are a time when the Holy Spirit is intensely active in our world. And the last days began with Christ's first coming. As he was born into this world and it will extend until after he returns. You with me? Right as he returns, once everything is finished and he uses that sword from his mouth and wipes out his enemy and starts that millennial reign, that lives the last days there. It's an ongoing period of intense work of the Spirit through the God's people to bring the lost into a relationship with Christ. And that is the point of why we are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Yes, it's cool to see these things happen, but the main purpose is so that men will repent and come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It is power to witness of the resurrected King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Woohoo, glory. I've got Holy Ghost goosebumps all over me. Hallelujah. Glory. Believers everywhere will do spiritual battle against the forces of wickedness in this world. And be powerful witnesses of Christ's love. If you don't have love for people and you're trying to be a witness for Christ, you're missing the point. Amen. It'd be a powerful witness of Christ's salvation, of the fact that he died and rose again from the dead. You see, Muhammad doesn't do miracles. Buddha doesn't do miracles. False prophets of those don't do miracles like Christ does miracles. Amen. Amen. You see, the King of kings and Lord of lords dwells in heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit so that we can do these things, so that we can pray to the Father, so that the Holy Spirit can draw men unto salvation, so that we can see people repent of their ways and turn towards Christ, so that we can see the miraculous happen, so that we can see good things take place. Mm. Good things. Also, to be a powerful witness of Christ's redeeming grace. That is the reason why we need intense spiritual power among us, God's people, throughout the church so that we can be witnesses. You see, the promise of the Holy Spirit is for every believer of every generation. God is not done yet. The trumpet hasn't sounded yet. So that means there is a work still to be done. God's not done healing. God's not done with the miraculous. God's not done seeing people saved. He's not done yet. 
that means we've still got work to do. This should get us excited to want to do those things he's called us to do. And you know, this isn't about us. This is about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And this is about saving those that are headed to hell and pulling them out of the fire so that they too can have eternal life. Heaven's plenty big enough for everybody. It is. Glory. That, I'm going to stop right there for just for a minute. You, you realize that the, the, it'll, more people means it, more fellowship, right? We've got all of eternity. Life on this earth is short. I mean, it's really short. Even if you live to be 175, okay, it's really short. Eternity goes on and on and on and on. Why not spend our time leading people to Christ so that we can get to know them better in eternity. Are you with me? And spend the time now to invest in people so that we can meet with them in eternity and, and, and have more friends in heaven, if you will. It's not a selfish desire either because the Lord's desire is that none perish and that all come to repentance. So that should be our desire too. That's a good thing. It's a God thing. All right. Stepping down from that one, let's move on. Peter explained to the crowd that the promised gift of, the whole, uh, of power from the Holy Spirit was for them and their children and for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ in every area, era and generation until he returns. He said, this is for you and for all them afar off that believe. And afar off not only means a distance here, but also a distance through time. God's not done yet. The time of the disciples is not over. The time of miracles is not over. We are still in it. So we need to start acting like it. Amen? All right. So how is the Holy Spirit baptism related to our salvation? Well, newsflash, it's not required for salvation. It's not. As a matter of fact, Romans uh, 10, 9, and 10 tells us, If you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Salvation is received then through confession of sin and faith in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And listen, salvation won't make a lick of sense to anybody if you just give them the ooey-gooey style, the story. The ooey-gooey story goes like this. You've got a God-shaped hole in your heart that only God can fill. That's the ooey-gooey story, okay? People are going to come to Christ. How you win them to Christ is how you're going to have to keep them that way. Okay, ooey-gooey. The way to really win men to Christ is to show them the law and how they have offended the Lord and that one day there's coming a time we have to pay for that offense. That's the not so ooey gooey way. That's the biblical way. The biblical way doesn't seem like fun, but you're not gonna get a bunch of false converts or people that are gonna backslide on you afterwards because they come to Christ realizing that yes, I have sinned, I am a sinner, I am a wretch in the sight of the Lord God. I, my, my righteousness are filthy rags. I am a jerk compared to the Lord and what he expects. Even though I might be a good person, I've never killed anybody. You know, I've never done this or that. But even still, it's the heart of a man that the Lord looks at, not the outward appearance. And when we realize that we are wretch in the sight of God and that there's nothing we can do about it until we repent from our sin and put our faith in Christ, then we have a sure foundation to stand on. We won't have to be ooey-gooey about this all the time. When the tough times come, we don't, we don't base our salvation off of how I'm feeling at the moment. I feel up. My salvation's good. I feel down. I'm just going to walk away from everything. You aren't like that. Instead, whether thick or thin, whether it's good or bad, no matter what you're going through, you recognize that no matter whether you're on the top of the mountain or in the bottom of the valley, that Christ is on the throne and you have been forgiven of your sins and you've got eternal life and nothing will move you away from that. Hallelujah. Glory. So the, the Holy Spirit, salvation is received through confessing our sin and faith in Jesus, sacrifice for our, on the cross for our sins. And according to Scripture, there's no further requirement for salvation beyond this. Now, yes, you're going to walk in holiness and, and do those things to stay there, but you don't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit for that. See, the Holy Spirit convicts people of their need of salvation. When people who do not know Christ hear the truth of the gospel and sense an urgency to align with its teachings, 
then they are experiencing the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit draws people to Christ's love and salvation as truth is shared with them by Christians or revealed to them as they read Scripture. Salvation is a prerequisite to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, though. Acts 2, 36 through 38, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, Peter challenged those listening to, them, to him to repent and be baptized. Water baptism, now we do water baptism. As a matter of fact, coming up here in, in just, uh, I think April, in April, we're gonna have a baptismal service. So if you're interested in getting water baptized, hey, let us know. We'll, we don't sprinkle, we dunk. We don't hold under until you really repent. We just, we do dunk, okay? But water baptism is an outward sign of inward change. <clears throat> I have received Christ. I am buried with him and I come up again with him because of Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's a sign of water baptism. Um, to receive the Holy Spirit baptism, we must first seek forgiveness of sin and establish a relationship with Christ. And the Holy Spirit resides within us, yes, from salvation. We see from John 14, 15 through 17, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, get this, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Hmm? All right. We, when we begin a relationship with Christ, the Holy Spirit takes residence in our lives. He guides us into truth, warning us when we do wrong, and helps us to grow in our walk with, with Christ. We can sense his presence because, as John states, he lives with you and will be in you. Yet there's an even greater dimension to the Holy Spirit, and that is the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So how do we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, it begins with a sincere desire. And it must not be regarded as some sort of achievement in the life of a believer that allows us into acceptance into a particular group of Christians or church. We've seen this happen. It's scary. Not here, but I've seen it happen other places where it's like, oh, you've got it or not. Well, you don't, you know. You're... No, that's not how we treat people, okay? You want to lead them into that, yes. But it's not an achievement that we get to bring us into a certain state here. It shouldn't be viewed as a spiritual option either that could be pursued or ignored. Nor should it be viewed as something that gives a superiority to others. Simon the sorcerer got himself into some hot water over this. You find this in Acts 18 through 24. Simon's following the disciples around. He's like, hey, I'm gonna pay. I'll, give me this power. I've got money. I'll pay for this power to do this. And the disciple looked at him and said, May you perish with your money. And the sorcerer realized at that point, I'm in trouble here. Please pray that none of these things come upon me. He still didn't have that relationship down, did he? He was just looking at the power aspect of it. Sincere desire for spiritual power to follow God's plan for our lives and ministries forms a proper motivation for this gift. It is received by faith. I want you to understand it is the Lord's will for you to receive this gift. Know that the Lord Jesus promised to send his Holy Spirit to all that believe. Now the recurring biblical sign for baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in languages you have not learned. Acts 10, 44 through 46, while Peter is still, still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now, Acts 2 reveals two other signs, wind and tongues of fire. That'd be awesome to see. But the foreign languages, the speaking in tongues, is the only recurring sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that is repeated in Scripture. Uh, additionally, in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, the Apostle Paul testifies to speaking in tongues frequently. Thus, speaking in tongues is described as the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
It's one of our uh, 16 fundamental truths in the assemblies of God. It also, speaking in tongues, indicates submission to the Holy Spirit, often arising during times of sincere prayer and praise. After Jesus ascended into heaven, his followers gathered in a place called the Upper Room in Jerusalem. There they came together for constant and frequent prayer, faithful prayer. And their example is important to us. As we fill our hearts with praise and adoration toward God and sincerely desire the gift of the Holy Spirit, God will pour this gift into our lives in, in this dynamic way. Through it, we're able to express praise to God and intercede for needs more fully and powerfully than what is possible in our own language. So what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit baptism? Through this gift, again, we receive power to witness. Acts 1.8 tells us this. Speaking in tongues must not be the end purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's only the initial physical evidence. <coughs> Excuse me. But through this experience, believers are empowered to be more effective witnesses of Jesus Christ to others. Our witness is to be, both, uh, is to be local, not only local, but regional, and then national and global, wherever we travel. Wherever we live, travel, we're just called to be Jesus people and to tell others about Christ. And the Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to do that. He's the one who empowers us to be with his witnesses. Through that, the gift of the Holy Spirit, we receive supernatural boldness and enablement to witness for Christ through word and action. And you can see this in the word of God. Prior, when Jesus was on trial, prior to Jesus even being put on trial, Peter looks at Jesus and says, I'm going to die for you. I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you, Jesus. If they, if I'm going down with you. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, hey, before the cock even crows three times, or, or, you're, or, three, or before it even crows, you're going to deny me three times tonight. Peter's like, no, I'll, I'll die with you. And sure enough, Peter denied Christ three times, and then that rooster crowed, and he realized what he had done. So this is the Peter we see prior to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Scared powerless, running, ashamed. The Lord comes back and restores Peter. And then he tells him to wait for power from on high. So you have the Peter when Christ is being crucified that night and then you get into the book of Acts and you find Peter boldly preaching to a large audience and 3,000 people were added to the church that day. What a revival service, amen? Whole different person. You've got the timid one versus the bold one. And the bold one, the difference is the power of the Holy Spirit had come upon him. And he had the words to say and the power to prove it. Hallelujah. In other passages and acts, leaders are described as being full of the Spirit and wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit or full of the Holy Spirit and faith. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is about winning the spiritually lost for Christ. As Bruce comes this morning, as we can finish out this last small portion here, you see, when Jesus met with his followers after his resurrection, he emphasized that forgiveness and rep repentance and forgiveness of sin would be preached to all nations. But before that could happen, they were to wait for the promise of the Father and to be clothed with power from on high. You may be sitting here this morning thinking, I am just not wired for witnessing. Yes, you are. If you've received Christ as Savior, what you need next is the power of the Holy Spirit. After Pentecost, Christ's followers were, were uniquely, or they, they were empowered to fulfill his mandate to reach the lost, and multitudes began coming to Christ. If we try and do this without the power of the Holy Spirit, yes, we'll be effective to a point. But do you really want to make an impact in Sumter? Do you really want to make an impact wherever you, when you go home or wherever you're from? The power of the Holy Spirit. That's where we're going to see great things happen. After Pentecost, Christ's followers were uniquely empowered to fulfill his mandate to reach the lost and multitudes began coming to Christ. And that mandate remains to this day as does the availability of the Holy Spirit's power to fulfill it. And if you've not done so yet, begin seeking the promised power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You'll never be the same 
as you're empowered to make powerful differences in people's lives no matter where you are. You see, the, we're going to need the power in order to do what we've been called to do. Jesus already knew this, and he already told the disciples this. But you may not even have know Christ yet as Savior. That's going to be your first step. You may feel that tugging every time we talk about that. You just, either you get the, the white knuckle syndrome. Grabbing hold of the pew, you're standing there, and your knuckles get white. You're grabbing so hard, you don't want to come up to the front. I call that the white knuckle syndrome, okay? You feel that feeling on the inside, I got to make things right. Well, then make it right. Nobody's going to judge you for coming up. If anything, we'll rejoice with you. Hallelujah. Or it may be that you haven't been empowered from on high with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, make today the day. Would you stand with me this morning? The greatest promise ever made are fulfilled on a daily basis. Jesus still baptized people in the Holy Spirit with power. All we have to do is have the desire and to ask. That's what I did. Your pastor did that same thing. Laying on a bed back in, I think it was 1994, 6, somewhere around 96. I said, Lord, I want everything you've got for me. And I felt the power of the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other tongues and I haven't quit since. Still pray on a regular basis, letting him speak through me. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to enable us to be witnesses. And we saw in the word, and we saw this morning how Peter went from timid Peter to bold Peter, from, from Peter who run away from, from a challenge to Peter who had, had been, was eventually martyred for his faith. What is your desire today? Is it to be baptized and be full of the Holy Spirit and be a bold witness of Christ? Are you speaking, seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And do you desire to be filled with his presence and power? Again, first things first, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you need Christ this morning, you need to repent of sin, would you lift your hand up this morning? Listen, this is, not an, this is a most important decision of your life that you will ever make right here because your eternity depends on your decision today. Your eternity depends on whether or not you're gonna follow Christ. There is a day coming that the Lord will judge this world. There is a day coming that he will judge man and open up those books. And if your name is not found written in the book of life, then you will be doomed. And I don't say that out of a, a fire and brimstone preaching. I say that out of love and compassion. If you have not yet repented of your sin, would you do so this morning? Father God, I pray for any in this place that haven't made that step of faith. And I ask that you would work in their heart. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would draw them unto Jesus. I don't want to rush this. This is important. Are your hearts pliable this morning? Are you ready? Are you ready for the Holy Spirit to move? Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place to continue to move. I ask that you would baptize those that need the baptism of the Holy Spirit right now. If you need that right now, would you lift your hands across this place? Would you raise your hands up high? If you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, raise them up. Raise them up and receive this morning by faith. Speak out those words that he puts into your heart. You're going to have to open your mouth and let it rip. Hallelujah. Father God, you see these requests right here. We raise our hands in anticipation for you to move and for you to, to baptize us in the name of Jesus and to baptize us in the Holy Spirit with power. Lord, you see the desires of our heart. And I'm asking that you would fill this place right now in Jesus' name. And I say to those who to receive, to receive right now in Jesus' name. Receive it by faith. Receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Receive it in Jesus' name. Bless you, Lord. We praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Bless you, Father. Lord, receive our praise this morning. 
Receive our praise this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Bruce, would you lead us in a chorus this morning? Hallelujah. you still need that, I want you to come up right now. I've, I've got a, I, the Lord is dealing in my heart. He said, call him up. I want you to call. I want If you still need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want you to come up the front. Don't forget what people think. Just come on up front. Saints, I want you to pray. Listen, I want you to pray in the Spirit. If you can pray in the Spirit, you pray in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Bruce is going to continue to play. Uh, I'm going to dismiss you guys. I'm going to stay up here and pray with these guys for a while. So if you would, please, uh, you're quietly dismissed, and we will see you this evening. Uh, and we're going to continue to pray. Thank you.